Stanford University. Hosting this seminar series with Tina Seelig and Tom Kosnick this spring. So, welcome. Um, I'll get us underway officially here in just a moment. But uh, feel free, anybody uh, looking for seats? We've got a number of, another, a number of them today. Uh, I think the weather is nice, <laughs> it's too nice. But um, I, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome everybody to the Draper Fisher Jervison. Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar Series brought to you by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, SDVP, and the Base uh, Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students, BASIS. Um, this talk is archived for viewing uh, by SCPD, as well as um, on the eCorner site, which I, if you have not had a chance to download the new uh, eCorner app for the iPhone, it's fantastic, and you can watch these and other uh, seminar talks. Uh, the entire series is generously underwritten by our friends at Draper Fisher Jurvetson. So I'm pleased to introduce an old friend, uh, Jeff Moore. It's r wonderful to have him back to this seminar series, which has its roots when Tom Kosnick got it underway in the 1990s. Jeff is here to preview his sixth book. Um, and I remember the first time he, he was here. Uh, but even before that, I remember uh, meeting him when he published what has become standard language in Silicon Valley and, and similar places around the world called Crossing the Chasm. This is one of the, the original copies of, from that first year in 1991. That was 20 years ago, about the same time some of you were born, uh, that Crossing the Chasm was published. And I'm so proud to have found it today, complete with his signature at that time. Um, Jeff, at the time, was at Regis McKenna, which was the public relations firm and market relations firm here in Silicon Valley. Uh, at, uh, but he went on to start his own firm, the Chasm Group, and then joined Moore Davidow Ventures, which is a venture capital firm, uh, as a venture partner. Uh, and that's what he, he does right now. And from their website, I really like it. It says, quote, getting a disruptive innovation across the chasm is the fundamental challenge for all venture-backed entrepreneurs. Helping them succeed is my, is my life's work. He's done that in a variety of ways, including, like we talked about, or uh, like I said earlier, uh, publishing uh, five books to date. Uh, you would think, wow. Where does he get that from? Well, one, reason, way, one way he does it is he was a bachelor's in literature, yay humanities, here at Stanford University, and went on to get a doctorate in literature from the University of Washington. So let's welcome Jeff Moore oh, back to you. campus. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Perfect. All right. OK. All right. Now, usually I try to preview this stuff before it's published so that you guys can help me make sure it's not as dumb as it would be. But this time, I actually must have missed the calendar. So. This is actually now uh, a book that is uh, going to come out in September. And uh, Tom said the sixth book. The first three books were written in the 90s, and they were all about that. Inc the, sometimes we call it the time of the great happiness. It was, it was this uh, unbelievable rush of technological enthusiasm. And it seemed like no matter what you did, it was just magically successful. And then the last three have been written in the last decade, where frankly, there's been a sort of a maturation in the tech sector. And the larger companies have become more of a part of my world than they were in the first decade. So this is a book which is written, if you notice what the subtitle is, Free Your Company's Future from the Pull of the Past. And this is a book written to major companies that have had established franchises. They're very successful. They can afford to send their, their employees to places like Stanford for, for executive ed. Um, but they're kind of stuck. They're, whatever it is that their success um, uh, activity is kind of created enough inertial momentum that it's hard for the, anything else to get, to get on board. And so what this book's about is how would you address that? Now, it's a, whole, it's a book, and this is a short talk. So what I've decided to do in this talk is do two things. The first half of the, of the talk I would like you to think of yourself as either you're on the board of directors or you're the CEO of, your, of Microsoft. You're John Chambers, you're Steve Ballmer, you're Leo Apotheker, you're, you're Carol Bartz, you're the head of a big company. And, and I kind of want you to look at it from kind of the top down. And then halfway through, I'm going to switch to a chapter which is more oriented toward 
I'm in the middle of a big company, what can I do to, to change things from the position I'm in as opposed to, as opposed to the, the very top? So let me kind of kick this off with, with an overview. This notion of the problem of we're stuck, and it, it just, I have to say, it, it's virtually universal. Um, people kind of get, look, we have a successful franchise, but you can't stand still in tech. Between technology and globalization, things are really, really moving. Now, that's great news for opportunity, but it's also for people that stand still, it's a threat, as our friends at Borders, for example, have discovered this year, and, and numerous other companies. So everybody gets that they've got to engage with growth. It's not like, hey, I've got an idea for you, right? They, they got it. What they, what they don't like talking about, which they universally acknowledge, is there is massive internal resistance to moving resources away from established activities into new activities. Massive. And, and, and so and, and that's kind of like the innovator's dilemma idea, you know, the anti corporate antibodies, that kind of stuff. So we've, we've talked about it for a long time. We haven't been very good about doing much about it. So year in, year out, the experience is Man, it's, it's Windows again, it's Office again, it's routers and switches again, you know, it's, 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 it's you know, direct adver display advertising for Yahoo again. And it's like, and even, even as something as young and as vibrant as Google, why did, they, why did Larry Page come back in? I think Google's beginning to feel like we need to escape. We're only 10 years old or barely 10 years old. We need to escape from the pull of our past. So the problem is the new stuff, it's not that there's not new stuff. There's tons of new stuff but it doesn't ever reach materiality, meaning it never reaches like being 10 or 20% of the total company's revenue. You know, it, it, gets, it gets announced, it gets started, and then it, somewhere along the line it dies on the vine. And so that's where we came with this notion. These are questions that basically our clients asked us. That's where the title came from. How can we achieve escape velocity? You know, how do we free ourselves from the pull of the past? So just to make clear, this is not a trivial problem, nor is it trivial companies that have struggled with this problem. These are some of the very, very best companies that tech has ever put on the, on the playing field. So the notion that you are smarter than this problem, that a Stanford student would not have this problem, even though, because you are very smart, it's not true. You will have this problem. So, so the question then becomes, what the heck is going on? And that's about the nicest language I will use tonight. Um, so what's the mistake we keep making over and over again? So it turns out the way that the global management system works, and largely this is a management system that was developed in the United States, but it's become completely global. It's a performance-oriented management system. That's how people get compensated in large corporations. So performance is, and by the way, not a bad idea, right? I mean, performance is critical success, right? We're, and we're good at managing it. But here's the second sentence. Power fuels performance and performance consumes power. That is not visible in a large corporation. It's a little bit like um, this, you know we want to have this carbon cap and we want to tax carbon emissions? Because right now, if you pollute the air, it's free. And as long as it's free, people will continue in a behavior. Well, consuming power in most compensation systems in most corporations is free. And furthermore, creating power, say around a new strategy, is not compensated. So I get compensating for consuming power for my performance. I do not get compensated, nor do I held, be held, am I held accountable, except in the most kind of qualitative ways, for generating power. So why would you be surprised that large organizations systematically consume their power? Now the interesting thing is, in a mature industry, you can do that for a long, long time. General Motors consumed its own power for 40 years. Okay? Eventually, it ran out of power. Eventually, the battery will go dead. Okay? But it takes a long, long time. And, and, so, and, and, and the performance metrics don't, don't track against that. So we need to replenish power if we're going to go for the long term. People get that conceptually. Behaviorally, it's hard to integrate it into the corporate systems. Okay? And part of the problem is we don't have a very good vocabulary for talking about power. Right? People recognize it when they see it. Is this, the, this is the Supreme Court justice about pornography, right? I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Well, the same thing with power. You know? But the problem is if you can't define it, if you can't articulate it, how the heck are you going to hold anybody accountable to it? How, how are you going to make sure that you're... And by the way, when you lack power, it will show up in your stock price. Not in the earnings, because performance creates earnings, in the P of the PE ratio. 
the price to earnings ratio. It's the P that well, P is for power, right? And, and so if you have a lot of power, you will have a high PE ratio. You'll have a high multiple on your stock. When you consume power and don't replenish it, you'll see it going to, to one and even below one okay? as you get, as you get uh, into trouble. And so what happens in a world in which we don't consciously manage power is we continue to, to put anxiety and pressure to perform, perform, perform. But every quarter, it's a little harder to do than the last quarter. And then if you eke out that quarter, you get to try again. And the numbers keep going up, and your power keeps going down. And so you become kind of neurotic, right? I mean, and there's a kind of a sort of a co collective neurosis around the end of the quarter. And it becomes this incredible event, which you must not sacrifice anything to. And, the, and when you're that desperate, you've already missed the quarter. You just question which quarter you're going to miss. Because you're so far behind the power curve, you've, you've, you've lost touch with, with the, the engine of your own company. People kind of get this, but they can't translate it into behavior. Okay? So this is what we call the performance trap. And, and m m many cultures are very proud about being a performance culture. So this is a little bit provocative when we sort of put this out there. But, but, but we're pretty confident in the case we're making. OK, so what would you do? And the, and the answer is you need to manage power explicitly or directly. You, we have to find a mechanism to do that. What you discover is the performance activity begins when you start next year's annual budgeting process by handing out last year's budget and saying, you see the fourth quarter numbers? Multiply them by four and start there. And that immediately starts a zero-sum game about resource allocation, which is why it's so hard to move resources inside the company. Because the person's looking at, I have a bigger number to make the next year than I have last year. I've got the same, they froze my resources, at least in theory. The last thing I can contemplate is using my resources for something else, right? And so immediately, so if you're going to get ahead of that problem as a management team, now you're the CEO and you're running your annual calendar. The quarter before you would start your budgeting strategy process, you start the power process. Okay? And, 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 this is, and by the way, in that, if, if you don't have a specific resource allocation pressure, sort of sword of Damocles hanging over your head, there's lots of stuff to do here. People have lots of ideas about the, ne the next category, the next things we ought to get into, how we could be successful. There's, there's lots of opportunity. The key idea is allocate resources to those initiatives before you allocate anything else. In the last book, we called this fund core before context. But that's not what happens in large corporations. Once the budget goes out, you're funding context before core. So do it before. Drive accountability for power into the operational plan. There are metrics of power. Sales velocity, you know, share capture and target segments. There's a bunch of stuff, that, even market share itself. There's a bunch of stuff that, that demonstrates that you have accumulated more power. Okay? But you have, to, you have to create those metrics and put them in the comp plan. Today, they're not in the comp plan. The comp plan is based on revenue and earnings generation in the current quarter, in the current fiscal year. It is a consumption-oriented comp plan. It is not a replenishment-oriented comp plan. Now, you're, the fact that you get stock options is intended to incent you to want to replenish, but it's too indirect. It's just it's too indirect a, uh, a, a metric to make, it, to make it work. But you can do it. You can add power metrics to performance. You can earmark resources for prior program usage only. And you can modify the comp program to hold people accountable to do it in, in, in ways that people will, will, will sign up for. But to do it, and kind of where this book comes in, is you kind of need a better vocabulary to talk about power. And, and, and so what the, the, we, we created a model called the hierarchy of powers. It's kind of a framework of frameworks. And it, the intention of this hierarchy is to let people sort out the power equation in a set of, of levels that make sense. So, let me, so the hierarchy of powers is just five powers. But you talk about each power separately from the other four. And you talk about them in sequence from top to bottom. And the reason why that sequence exists from top to bottom is, is actually a lesson we learned from the investment community. When investors allocate assets, the first thing they do is they allocate it by category. Actually, even by category. But they'll say bonds versus equities versus you know, uh, uh, you know, cash, cash in hand or whatever. right? So, so, uh, but but within, uh, within equities, they'll say, do oh, you want to be in retail? Do you want to be in, in natural resources? Do you want to be in tech? Do you want to be in whatever? Okay? 
And so category power has to do with how, how fast are the categories that you are in growing? Because if you're in a category that's growing at 100%, even if you're kind of a doofus, you're probably going to do pretty well this year, right? And, and investors aren't stupid. By the way, vice versa, if you're in a category that's growing at 4%, you have enormous pressure on you to make sure you make every penny of your earnings. And it's very, very hard for you to do much better than that because the category is giving you no lift whatsoever. You can take share in a category that's not growing, but not forever. Eventually, you, you run into a wall. So investors at the margin would prefer your company to be in high growth categories, not low growth. So a company like General Electric would routinely sell off low growth businesses in order to get capital to buy high growth businesses. And they would kind of migrate the footprint of the corporation going forward. That's to, in order to have more category power. You can hold your company accountable to what categories you're in. The board of directors can hold the management team ac accountable to that. The next one is company power. So in the categories you're in, how powerful are you? Do you control your own destiny or is somebody else calling the tune and you're just trying to you know, keep step and, and, keep, and keep pace with them? This is market share. This is Jack Welch saying, you, know, you want to be number one or number two or you don't want to play. Because okay? you wouldn't have enough company power to get the return of, on being in that category. You ought to get out of that category and get into some categories where you can be number one or number two. Okay? So it's about power. The third one is market power, and it has to do with are you in the markets that are the fastest growing segments or the fastest gro or, or the more strategic segments? Now, category and market sometimes get confused, but category is defined by a group of competitors, and markets are defined by a group of customers. And as long as you kind of keep that sort of simple code in your head, you will not confuse the two of them. So a market's about getting a group of customers. And the idea here is a little bit like winning primaries for a pre presidential nomination. You, you want to win the New Hampshire primary. There are not very many delegates in New Hampshire, but it's a very strategic primary to win. And in markets, there are always segments that are early bellwether segments. Now, they're different for different market, uh, different technologies or different categories, but there's always some. And, and so winning those early, or, or maybe there's a, a segment that's in transition where the segment like this particular part of the economy is completely being disrupted by the internet this year. So they need, whatever they're going to buy, they're going to buy this year. So get in there and, and be successful if, if it's the kind of stuff that we sell. That's what market power is about. Winning segment shares in the critical segments. Offer power is based on how compelling is your offer compared to the rest. We talk about net differentiation. You know, how different is it, but then also how, how, how how comparable is it to the, are you living up to the norms of your category? That's kind of table stakes. And then, you know, how different is it? We're gonna, I'm gonna come back to offer power, so I won't say more about it right now. And then execution power is when you guys set yourself out to do something, when you're gonna enter a new category, when you're gonna do one of these transformational initiatives, can you actually get it done? Or, or do you find yourself, you know, kind of redoing it? So if you look at this thing, we often sit down with, with our clients and we'll say, Let's just ask a couple of questions kind of among us kids. And doors closed and there's no recording devices going, right? So the questions go like, are we in high growth, are we in the high growth categories or do we have category envy, right? HP right now must have tablet envy, right? It has to, right? You see, everybody looks at Apple going, ah, like that, okay? Right, category envy, right, okay? Company power. Do customers and competitors see us as the team to beat, or is that somebody else? Just let's just be honest with each other. Where are we? Where are we? In, and think about your company or the company you may have been in before you came here, or the company you're in now, or the company you intend to go to. Okay? Market power. Are we winning the key primaries definitively, or are, and are we winning them fast enough? A lot of times, oh yeah, we're going in the right market, but it's like one year, two years, three years, nothing's happening. It's dying. You're not. That's not what we meant. Winning meant, you know, moving, moving on. So do your flagship offers, you know, uh, set the bar? Or, or, or are you always playing catch up and, and, and not doing it fast enough? And we'll, we'll come back to that again, as I said, with offer power. Can you make stuff happen and make it stick? Or are you continually pushing the reset button? There is nothing more discouraging than being in a large corporation which does a massive reorg once or twice a decade because the last team couldn't get it done. And you just kind of, it feels like that you're watching this very large sort of drain. You know, this water is just going like this. It's taking a long time, but it only appears to be one way that this thing is going to go. Okay. Very, very and, and so it's important when you sit here to say, 
you know, the questions you want to ask are, where, where are we strong and where do we need help? And no matter how good or how bad you are, you probably have places that you're better than others. And so what are we going to build on and where do we need to, where do we need to, to go forward? But I hope you can see that each one of those topics is different from the other four. Because what happened before, when people would say, we're going to have a discussion about strategy. And strategy is normally about power, but about achieving a position of power. What are we going to do to achieve a position of power? That's kind of what strategy means. But the problem with the, our, the dialogue around strategy was it would go up and down through these five levels of category, mixing and matching, making arguments that never, ever connected. So it was always like, like this. And so, and so at the end of the day, well, you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe, and let, now let's argue about who gets the head count. Right? And so we would, we, that's why you would default back to a performance model. Because in a performance model, it's like, well, who wins? Well, whoever got the most revenue or the most, uh, or the most margin, the most, the most earnings. So it was a way of essentially saying, since I can't talk about this articulately at the level of power, I will only measure at the level of performance. And, 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 and that leads to that slow draining of the corporate battery. Uh, and by the way, you know, there was a time when these companies all had enormous power. That's why we've heard of them. That's how they got up to the top of the mountain in the first place. Now they're kind of going down the mountain. They're not getting their, they're not renewing their power. But you know, that was a very tall mountain they got to the top of at one point in their lives. And so they had Novell at one point was the power company in networking by far. And then it just, you know, year after year after year after year. It's still around, but it's kind of toward the bottom of that mountain, right? Okay. So that, that's the stuff we're talking about, just to, to kind of make it dirt obvious, you know, like, okay, so let's apply this to Apple, because right now they're the you know, golden child. So what categories are they in? Well, music, mobility, and media. All of them are still growing at hyper growth rates. That's pretty cool, okay? By the way, the, even the Mac, they've, they've, they've brought back into hyper growth. Uh, the company power, so team to beat in all three. Like, is there anybody else who you would say would be Apple's trying to catch up to in those things? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Market power? We don't need no stinking markets. We got the world, right? I mean, right now the truth is they are so powerful. Right now, do, do they do certain kinds of things? Sure. Are they looking at the business market in some ways? Yes, they have programs. But basically, nah. It's like, man, people are beating a path to it. They're waiting outside of our stores at midnight to get an iPhone that is white. <laughs> Okay, enough said, enough said, okay? So the offer powers are like huge, and by the way, it's not just the products, it's the, it, you know, it is iPod plus iTunes, you know? It is iPhone and iPad plus App Store. I mean, it, it's a huge, this is a dominantly powerful uh, situation. And they did all of this in less than a decade. Like, so what do you, what? So you, you kind of turn to every other leader in tech saying, so what are you guys doing? You know, like, so what are you up to, huh? No, not, not much, huh? Okay, just want to check. Okay, so, so that's why it is currently, currently I think it's, I, this was true earlier this year, I, I think it's still true. Well, I know it's the most, still the most highly valued company in tech. It's about $320 billion. Microsoft's about 220. But there was a time, not very long ago, maybe still, it was the second most valuable company in the world. Exxon and then Apple. Okay, so, so, so this issue of power, and, and if you look at a guy, you say, well, what's Steve about? One of the things Steve is about is he cares about power, and he assumes performance will take care of itself. Jeff Bezos is the same way at Amazon. That's why periodically he does stuff that just drives the shareholders crazy, because he gives away performance in the short term because he says, I want the power. He's always done that. So you, you can do it, and there are examples, but the problem is they tend to be examples of companies that are run largely th through a charismatic founder who is just a, has a you know, power instinct. Okay? Uh, Bill Gates being a third just, you know, amazing example. OK, so just to kind of close on this thing, in terms of how this category, uh, hierarchy of power affects the corporate dialogue, there are three things that, that a CEO is asked to articulate in relation to, the, to, to this power hierarchy. The first is a vision. And the vision is about what is happening in the world in the zone of your category. That, that, the, the, that other people outside of your company care about and want to in, interact with. How, what role is your company going to play in the unfolding of those forces? And which markets are going to be the bellwether markets that are going to indicate how well you're doing? And that's a vision. That's when you talk about a vision for your company, that's what vision does. When you go down to strategy, you kind of go down one level. 
and you say, okay, we're in these categories, and because categories, strategies change by category. Okay, in this in, in this strategy, you know, what position? What's our power position relative to our competitors today? In what markets are we going to fight in order to change that position? And what offers are the critical offers that are going to change our power position relative to our competitive set? That's what strategy is about. And then when you go down one more, and it's execution, it's okay, guys. Now, now in terms of which markets with which offers and, and, and how fast, and, and this is back to weekly commits, monthly reviews, quarterly deliverables, we're just gonna get it done. And so all three kind of, of, these, uh, of these issues, vision, strategy, and execution, have a vocabulary of power around them that is useful, that can be, and every one of these things has a bunch of frameworks behind it. So what the book will share is a bunch of models about the, well, the category power, the category adoption life cycle, the technology adoption life cycle, how do things grow? I mean, I've been writing about that for a long time. But every one of these has its own set of models that you can bring out and say, okay, well, let's look at our company through this lens and kind of see how we stack up. So the intent is to create vocabulary with this book. It's not to say, you know, we know your business better than you know it. It's, it's just to say, look, look at your business through these lenses, okay? Clearer, blacker, sharper, which one, right? Kind of, kind of stuff. So these are some companies that we've been working with for the last 20 years. What they have in common is that every one of these companies we work with on an initiative for at least over a year that was sponsored directly by the CEO. So the CEO was in the middle of this initiative and we built these, these frameworks in conjunction with the teams led by these CEOs. And, and they, did, they did very well. I mean, this is sort of a little bit of a self, pat ourselves on the back kind of things, but they did. They, they, these things actually work. So I don't want to imply that this stuff is just a theoretical stuff because those are real companies that, that have done, had a lot of success with this stuff. Okay, so to close with this thing at the top level, if you were the board of directors and you were saying, okay, okay, Jeff, okay, we got this disease. Okay, great, great, great. What do we do? How do we start? You can start at any point in this hierarchy. You can start with the category power level, which tends to be, we need to look at our portfolio. We tend to have way too much money in aging categories, what the Boston Consulting Group taught us, cash cows, and, and we don't have enough rising stars. So th that could be the problem, okay? Or we could say, no, it's, it's a company power problem, and the problem is we can never, first of all, we can kill nothing, and second of all, we can never really make any big bets. Every big bet we hedge, and after a while, we, we're like the person at the roulette table who puts a chip on every single square. So we win every time, you know? It's like, except we just lose money, okay? So, so, so the, on the market focus, we can actually go after uh, markets in a directive way. It turns out it's extremely hard for large corporations to go after niche markets. But it's critical. It's critical, because otherwise you end up coming in second or third in every primary in the, in the entire uh, uh, election and you, and, and you don't get nominated, right? You, you must win definitively in places, particularly in the right, in the right year in the right place. And then offer power, which w w I'm gonna come back to that one, that's the one where we can create highly differentiated offers. I'm gonna, I, I'll say some, a lot more about that in a minute. And then organization. So, so how do we actually drive transformation initiatives uh, through the antibodies or whatever to actually get them done? There's, there are ways to organize inside a large company to create, carve out an entrepreneurial space, not just to incubate innovation, because all of them do that, but to actually go from an incubated innovation to a material business. That's when they all get killed. And, and so there's a whole, there's a whole uh, thing around execution power and organization for dealing with that. And what I'm gonna talk about in the second half of this talk is offer power and, and, and how it affects innovation. But before I do, since I've been blasting pretty hard for the last 25 minutes, questions or pushback or like if your crap detector went off, you know, it'd be good to sort of, you know, sort of, I mean, as you, uh, that was a pretty fast explosion, but just anything about that model that either calls you to ask, yes, yeah. So are there like sort of empirical metrics for figuring out which sectors of your company are not uh, sort of high growth areas? So the question is, are there empirical metrics for, for which sectors of your company are high, or not high growth efforts? Yes. The, the first one is simply to look at the, at the average growth rate of everybody in that sector. Okay? And, and basically, it's pretty straightforward. You look at what, what does it take to motivate a growth investor? It's typically 15 to 20% growth or higher. 
uh, maybe 15 to 30 might be a better range. And so if it's 15 to 30 or higher, it's definitely, that's a growth. If it's single digit, it's almost always low growth. And 10 to 15 is sort of a little bit of a muddy area. But what most companies often do is they'll have a portfolio where they'll have four businesses that grow at 4% and one business that grows at 8%. And they'll call the 8% business a high growth business. It's like, no, it's not. It's a taller midget, OK? <laughs> so don't, don't I mean, come on, there's no basketball player in the room, OK? So, 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 so that, 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 that's how you do it. Yes? How much of empirical evidence has shown that people or companies applying this principle is more successful than ones that don't? Because Apple is, you could apply a thousand frameworks, say, you yes, know, yeah, right. forces that's right. So, right? Like, <laughs> if you have an ice store, you too will be great. Right. You know, so what statistical significance is this principle? And right. if so, out of the five types of uh, point to entry, which one is the most powerful type um, compared to other things? So what are the things that company right. definitely needs to do? Right. right. So, okay, so, so, so you're talking to an English major, not a quant. So, so this is anecdotal, more qualitative, more than quantitative. That's kind of why I put up, though, those 20 companies that I had on that other slide, because at least those are 20 stories, not one story. But it's still, it's still qualitative. In terms of what's more powerful in general, category trumps company, company trumps market, market trumps offer, offer trumps ex execution. Largely, largely that's the, the way it goes. This one is it, offer power, however, can, can, is probably the lever that you're going to use if you're behind to, to move up, as, as you're going to see in the next section. But I think in general, you just you have to say, look, um, there's such, you, you, you remember that first slide with all the companies? That's kind of the negative proof. That's the proof that, that is, there's a common deterioration in the technology sector that appears to take two decades. And the number of companies that were successful two decades ago, I mean, you, are, aren't around anymore, okay? So say at least two and a half, I mean, in 1985, the leading enterprise software company was called Cullinet. Cullinane, Cullinet. No, John Cullinane, Cullinet. Who knew, right? So, 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 and, and the number one, right? Novell was number one in local area networking, right? I mean, these are not these were not chump change folks. Kodak was number one in imaging, in the whole world. Okay, not so much. Okay, so that that's the that's the best I can do. I mean, I, I and I and I and I would love for people who are more quantitative to say, well, I'd like to apply a little more research discipline to this because. Jeffrey is Irish, and the Irish are kind of famous for waving their arms, and he participates deeply in that genome. Yeah. Other, other, yes, yes. So you mentioned Jeff Bezos as an example of someone who is power driven, right? But that company is also somewhat spread thin. They are in web services, they are selling books, they are in the digital media business, and so on and so forth. How do you reconcile focus with you know, spreading yourself too thin? Well, I mean, I think the problem with spreading yourself too thin is you have the opportunity to gain power, but you dissipating, because you don't focus enough, you don't actually accumulate it. You actually end up dissipating it because you thrash. You go from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And I mean, right now, I would argue that Cisco is struggling with that right now. They have a management system. They have a, John laid out an incredibly ambitious agenda for the decade. I think there was nothing in that agenda that was stupid. I think the company has felt, man, there was just too much on our plate. And so lots of growth categories. The, the, you, the one that you would not criticize Cisco for is you're in low growth categories. That is not their challenge. Their challenge is can we get our arms around the categories that are most important. So you're watching them right now sort of try to pull back and achieve more focus. Because I think, I think at some point you do go too far. And you can't, it's, and by the way, that's a performance culture too. I mean, they have a very strong, it is not that you have power or performance. It's, this is the and, not the or. This is performance and power. One more, and then I'm going to kind of, kind of go, go for it. Yeah, OK, right in the middle, yeah. All right, so um, in the beginning, you had performance culture, and you said it was a good thing, right? But it went too far. Is there a, kind of the same thing for power? If you go too far on the power spectrum, um, is there a danger there? I, I, I think there could be, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you can get to the point where, you're, where you, are, uh, you actually lose your operating income to kind of keep yourself going. Um, and, and so, it, because in the short term, you often, sac you, you can make sacrifices in performance in order to invest in power. And if you overinvest in power and all of a sudden people stop believing in that, you, you can't get funded. You can't, you can't get your next round of funding. In general, by the way, venture investing is about power and 
public exchange investing is about performance, if you think about it. I mean, because in a, in a venture backed company, there's not enough revenue to really say that performance is, is the game changer. It's power is the game changer in venture. And that's why I think this was an easier book for me to write maybe than somebody else, because, because every Monday, every dialogue we have is all essentially about power. And it's usually category power first. And then, and, then, and then actually offer power becomes very, very important to a, to a venture company. Okay, I'm gonna move on to this notion of, now I want you to take off your CEO hat. I hope you kind of enjoyed that moment of leadership and the board of directors and whatever, and, and liability, I might add. Uh, some of you might look good in an orange jumpsuit, you never know. Um, <laughs> but but now, I'm, now I want you to go back and say, you know what, I, 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 left, this, I left this auditorium and, 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 and next Monday I, I took on an assignment in a, in, by and large, in a high tech company, and I'm a product manager or a product line manager. I now, I am now. And the, what is amazing about tech, by the way, is that is that product managers. The fundamentally, the unit of wealth creation in tech all of my life has been the product. Now, in, increasingly, the service as a sort of invisible product, but the the, uh, the, the product and product management is largely conducted by people in the first 10 years of employment. So all of a sudden, relatively early in a career, unlike most professions, most other industries, you actually have your hand on the tiller that changes the fate of your company. So it's an amazing privilege to work in a high tech company because the amount of power you get short, particularly if you can get into this role of product marketing, product management. So that's the role you have now. That's the role I'm gonna give you for the rest of this conversation. And your job now is, you have a really cool product, but you're living in a company that makes its living through a very old and boring set of products, okay? But they make money, okay? So, 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 so you, you, th this is your challenge, okay? So to understand the lever you have, you have some resources, and the question is, where are you gonna spend them and what are you gonna get for them, okay? So, so think about having an innovation budget. Not much, but some. Well, you could spend it on differentiation. And that means I'm gonna spend it on some kind of innovation R&D and I'm gonna create something unlike anybody think any, anything that anybody else has. And that's gonna cause the customer to go, wow, I want this offer, I don't want those other offers, okay? That, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more in a second. The second way you could spend your budget is hold on, Everybody else in our category now has this new feature and we don't. And people, by the way, are noticing it. So if we don't do some backfilling of this feature set, we're gonna, no matter how different we are over here, they're gonna go, yeah, yeah, it's an amazing car. There are no wheels on it though. You know, I mean, you kinda need wheels, don't you? Okay, so, so, so th there'll be that part. So now, now you've got, now your budget, now you got your budget's getting pulled in two different directions. Now you've got a third idea, which is, you know, if I could figure out a way to do some productivity things, maybe I could get some more money to spend on red and blue, okay? And so those, basically those are the three things you can, the three levers, the kinds of initiatives that you can, you can go. I'm gonna charter a differentiation thread, a neutralization thread, or a, or a, a productivity thread. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through them and I want, uh, there's, a, there's a lesson at the end of this, which is an amazingly, it seems like it's such an obvious lesson. It is almost universally not followed. The, the principle we're gonna follow, which just to give you a heads up on it is, these three things are not mutually compatible with each other. And whenever you charter a single team in a single project stream to do two or more, you're screwing up. And I, and I would say that 99% of all the project streams I see are combinations of those three things, which is a fairly high ratio for screwing up. Okay? So, so let me, but let me kind of walk you through it. That's, the, that's kind of the, the place where this is gonna end. So differentiate, why do you do that? To separate from your competitive set. Pretty obvious and pretty exciting. And by the way, every engineer in the world wakes up thinking, that's what I do for a living. I'm the smartest person on the planet and I will be able to demonstrate it, okay? Neutralize, catch up to the competition. Nobody likes to do this, okay? Nobody likes to do this. But they get that it's part of being an adult. Okay? So you say, okay, I'm an adult. I guess I have to make my bed. You know, I have to do a few things, okay. And then optimize, again, ugh, even, even worse for an engineer. It's like, what? You know, but, 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 but the point is, there's a big return on this 
if I can increase, if you, for, for you as the product manager, product line manager, if you can get this done, because there's a bunch of places where you have resources reporting to you doing stupid stuff, too much stupid stuff. And if you could actually get that initiative going, you could free up more budget to do the top two. Okay, so in each one of these areas, people make mistakes. And I mean, I'm not just, everybody makes mistakes. I mean, they make perceptual, conceptual mistakes. They think about it wrong. And so the intent of the, of the next few slides is to say, here's the most typical way you think about this thing wrong, and I want you to think about it differently. So with differentiation. So differentiation, first of all, it's, well, it's different. But the thing is, if you've ever actually noticed the world, everything is different. There's no two things that are the same, right? So different isn't a big deal, okay? It's, it, it's differentiation along a vector of value. Okay, so how much differentiation do we have? And can we go beyond the limits of the competitive set? What that means is, and you'll see in the next slide, I want to I want to be, I want to be the iPhone. I don't want to be the Samsung or the LG or the RIM or the whatever the other guys are. I want to be the one that's really different. Okay. Then, however, you've got to realize you've got to subtract out the unneutralized competitive threats. I'm an iPhone, I'm on an ATT network, and there's no coverage. Oops, that's not so good, right? You have to have coverage, it's a rule, okay? Uh, so, well, maybe it isn't, maybe it's an iTouch, okay? But, but, but the point is, 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 that, is that you have things where you fall, fall behind, and you go, well, that's not, it's a Macintosh, but it's slower than dirt, right? Okay, that kind of problems, okay? So, 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 so you, you can't just say I'm different. You have to say I'm also meeting the norms of the category in the stuff that I'm, that I'm not trying to differentiate on. And then, I, and as I said, if I, if I can add back in optimization, I can spend it more on one of the two above. So the, the net differentiation is what you're, that's as an offer manager, Product manager, service manager, that's what, you, that's what I want you to think about. Every year, my power increased because my net differentiation increased okay, relative to my competitive set in my, in my category. So this idea about differentiation is most of the time, most offers live inside the yellow circle here, which means that, that they have to compete against each other mano a mano for winning a customer's business. Shell gasoline, Chevron gasoline, you know, uh, uh, Union 76 gasoline. You don't go like, whoa, ho, 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 that was amazing gasoline, right? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what happens, okay? All right, but periodically people do get separation from the competitive set. And, and, and your job as an offer manager is to imagine that blue arrow and that blue asterisk and to say, what could we do with my offer to take it that far? Now, you may not get permission. The, the company may say back to you, you know what? I'm sorry, it's your first product you ever got. We're not spending any money on your product, okay? Rats. But, 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 but sooner or later, as a product manager, you will get an offer that says, you know what? You know what? If you could do that, I would like to see your plan for doing that. Okay? So do that. And if you don't do it, now you're just back into doing mono a mono. So if you look at some case examples, the people on the left all got competitive separation, and the people on the right did not. Okay, so IBM PS2, it was, a, it was not quite compatible with everything else. It just, it never kind of made it. You know, the Kindle versus Sony's PRS 500, okay, good. You know, got a glass screen, okay, but can, okay. iPhone versus Palm Trio. And, and this is really tough if you're Palm, right? Because it was, it was very different, but it just didn't get the separation. It just didn't happen, okay? Cisco Telepresence versus HP Halo, almost identical, but not quite, not quite. So in, in innovating to, to differentiate, separate yourself from the pack, sustain the gap. This is, a, this is an investment moment. You get to champion the idea. Somebody above you is actually going to give you the go ahead or not. But you need to champion. You need to create a vector that somebody could believe, wow, you really are going to get separation. And the, typically what you have, the reason why they believe it is there's something that the company owns that's unique to that company that can create what, what Andy Grove called a 10x effect. So Andy Grove would say 10x will get you apart from the crowd. So Salesforce was using SaaS against Siebel, against, against uh, um, you know, uh, uh, SAP, Oracle, whatever. And, 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 and they, they took themselves off. Skype had peer-to-peer -peer technology. Wikipedia had its open source model. And, and, and look how massively these things have changed the planet, right? VMware with its virtualization technology. Akamai with its overlay routing network. All of these companies are like, do not have any 
do not have, they have unmatchable offers at this state in the game. Now, are people catching up? Yes. Are there CDN people attacking Akamai? You bet. Are there virtualization technologies attacking VMware? Sure, of course there are. But, but look where they set themselves apart and how long they set. Look how much power those offers had to change the trajectory of, uh, 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 of a company. So, because these were companies that didn't have company power, right? They were all kind of startups. Who'd heard of Skype? Who'd heard of Akamai? You know, who, VMware? And, and Wikipedia, for God's sake, had no money, right? How could, they, how could they take the Encyclopedia Britannica and Encarta and make them irrelevant, right? Through offer power. Offer power did it, okay? Ground jewels. Now, the neutralized thing is the one that I think people make the most mistakes with. With, with Crown Jewel, the problem with the previous one is sometimes there aren't very many Crown Jewels around. And sometimes you, know, you can't find a way to be unmatchable and you just have to suck it up. Neutralization is a different problem. Neutralization means you know the world's progressing, competitors are innovating, and now all of a sudden it's my job to get back inside that yellow circle because I've kind of fallen out of favor. You know? and, and, and I've got to at least get, get I don't have to try to beat the blue asterisk, I just got to get my asterisk back inside, back in gear, as it were, you know? And, and so refocus, refocus, and once I get inside there, then I can talk about my differentiation again. But if I'm missing, if I'm still out here, the market won't talk to me at all. They'll say, well, you're not, you're not even qualified to be in the conversation because you haven't, you haven't met the minimum table stakes uh, to be in this game. So failure to neutralize, and there, there are some real cautionary tales on this one. So Microsoft brilliantly neutralized the Mac with Windows. But Nokia, did you see the memo from Stephen Elop a couple, uh, I guess it was last month or the month before? He, he, there's a sentence in that thing. He's the new CEO of Nokia. He writes a memo that's a public memo to the world which says, how is it possible that Apple came out with an iPhone in 2007 and Nokia does not have a response? Would you want to answer that question? Gee, Stephen, I wasn't the product manager. <laughs> Okay, so, but the point was, so, say, so ask yourself why. Well, why do you think? And, and my, I don't know, but my bet is because the engineers at Nokia were too proud to neutralize because they wanted to differentiate. They wanted to overleap the overleaper, okay? And when you do that, you, 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 you leave year after year after year of no effective response in the market which is absolutely fatal, okay? Microsoft and the web, remember when my, there was the memo with Bill Gates, we're, not, we're a software company, we're not a web, web company? And then it was like, oh no. And then it was like, he immediately neutralized Netscape Navigator. Now, Internet Explorer 1.0 was a farce. It was a pathetic attempt to pretend it was a browser, right? Interst the second release, not much better. But the third release, better than Navigator 3.0. So, so Microsoft actually was a brilliant neutralizer. Lotus Notes did not make the same kind of response. Lotus Notes kind of went inside the IBM world and it's kind of doing its General Motors thing. Okay? Netflix, Netflix with the web. Didn't you think when, when, when all of a sudden stuff is coming over the web, you think, well, that's the end of Netflix, right? Netflix is a CD descriptor. Not so. Mr. Hoffman is still the scourge of the media industry. He is Conan the Barbarian. They hate, I mean, they would just like, they would love to, well, I won't go into assassination, not this week. But, 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 but anyway, but they're thinking about it. Okay, but, 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 but Blockbuster, when Netflix came out, Blockbuster just stood there like a deer in the headlights, okay? And charged more for late, for late you know, stuff. <laughs> Google Apps versus Microsoft Office. Google's not trying to beat Microsoft Office. It's just trying to annoy them. Right? He's just trying to keep them busy and to kind of keep something going, right? <laughs> Yahoo, on the other hand, was more like Nokia. Yahoo wanted to overtake Google search. It was kind of like Captain Ahab and the white whale, you know? And it was a quest. And, and it was a fatal quest. And so what Carol had to do was get in and sell off the business because she had to free her company's future from the pull of the past. That was a really, really important thing for her to do. Apple and Kindle. So what did Apple do with Kindle? It co-opted it. Kindle pe most people, whoops, read their Kindle books on iPads, right? Because, because they co-opted it, okay? Whereas uh, the, 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 the Borders and, and, and their thing, no. And Borders, okay, next. Okay, <laughs> so the game here is catch up fast and assimilate the innovation. It's a game of speed, okay? It's how fast can you do it? How fast can you become good enough? 
I'm going to skip over this. There's some more stuff, but I'm going to go to the third one. So the third one's productivity. Productivity is when the category gets more efficient, and now you're too expensive. And you've got to, you've got to get yourself back, back in gear here. And we have a bunch of stuff. We do. This is actually a place where large companies have a ton of money tied up in the pull of the past that you can free up. There's the whole long tail problem they have. That's 10% of the revenue of this chart. It probably consumes 30% of the, of the resources. It's an amazing, the long tail wags the dog in large companies. So if you just crop off the tail and with some fairly, you know, some discipline, you, you, you centralize and standardize, that'll change it. Then there's the, the middle part. Now this is real business, but it's real business done in very sloppy ways. And by the way, the reason it's sloppy, big companies buy other big companies or they buy middle-sized companies and they merge them. How effective is a process do you think that starts in one company, goes to the other company, and goes back to the first company? Do you think there might be a little waste in there somewhere? Right? It's crazy. I mean, the amount of craziness that happens inside the world's best companies, when you work inside these companies, you go, how is it possible that we're winning? <laughs> God, the other people must be like just really bad. Because everywhere you look, it's just like there's just massive waste, and it drives you crazy, except you can't seem to do anything about it. Again, that's the re-engineering button. Modularize, optimize, just pick the low hanging fruit, go after it. And then finally, there's just outsource it. You know, there's, there's, if you get, you know, you can, you can take it and say, look, we're just not going to do this anymore. You know, we are not going to manufacture. It said, by the way, that little iPad, iPod, iPhone, whatever you got, it says designed in Cupertino. It doesn't say manufactured in Cupertino, because it's not. It doesn't say supported in Cupertino, because it's not. Right? And, and so you start figuring out what are the things I don't have to do, and those things I need to, I need to stick, keep visibility. But I need to outsource them. That turns out to be, as you can imagine, that, that is an enormous amount of work to do. But there's, there's, uh, there's lots and lots of resources available. And inside your own organization, as your product line manager, you don't have to do this for the world. You just have to do it for your team. Your team does stupid stuff all the time. And they hate it. So it's not like there isn't low-hanging fruit to go after. So here's, here's getting to, the, to, the, to the, sort of the money slide and the payoff punch that I telegraphed. Three different tracks, each one value creating. If you said, I don't do one of these columns, you've made a mistake. You must do all three. But notice that we're playing them to three very different goal lines. With differentiation, it really is unmatchable, and it is how far can I separate? Because if I'm too close to the herd, the problem is they catch up. Like, remember when AMD had the first quad core? It just kicked ass. And Intel sales went down for two quarters. Right? Oops, then they came back with their quad core. Now they're back inside the yellow circle. So it's really important if you're gonna, if you're gonna spend the risk, take the risk and spend the money to get outside, get way the hell outside, okay? Because it's, it's very dangerous to be just outside uh, the yellow circle. It's kind of, yellow circle ends up being like an amoeba. It goes like that, okay? <laughs> the neutralize, okay? You've got to get comparable, not better than, just good enough, but you've gotta do it fast. Amazingly fast. That's the one everybody misses. People don't pay enough. They don't pay enough time on, 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 on the speed thing. And they don't, they, don't, they don't frame the project to be fast, except the ones that are brilliant at it. This is what Microsoft does better than any company in the world by about an order of magnitude. And maybe not so much anymore as they used to. But this is the thing. This is why Microsoft could routinely let anybody innovate anything and say, I'm going to take it away from you. I'm going to take it away. Okay? I'm going to be good enough very quickly, and then eventually I'm going to assimilate it into either Windows or Office, right? One of the two. Okay? All life will be part of either Windows or Office. Okay? <laughs> so when you mix modes, it creates waste. And one of the most obvious ones of this is, you see where, where the, the, the key metric for productivity is you want to be best in class? And you do. On productivity metrics, the goal is to be best in class, and you benchmark yourself against other companies, and it's exactly what you should do. But what happens if you try to be best in class as the goal for a neutralized project? Well, you spend way too much. Best in class is a lot more than good enough. Good enough is all we need. And worse, not only do you spend too much, you spend too much time. Every quarter that you do not neutralize that, that threat is a quarter it gets to build up more momentum against you. This is just dumber than dirt, okay? But it is the standard operating procedure in company after company after company. And then best in class is not good for differentiation because you've got to be beyond class. Best in class is the, the kind of the biggest midget in the yellow circle, right? 
It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm the best in class. Yeah, but I don't get to charge any more money because, you know, so, so, so it's really important to, sep to separate with that thing. OK, so this leads to a concept we call one playbook per project. Now, the way you fund things in the world, probably you have one budget that has to be split among those three things. All I'm asking you to do is don't tie the differentiation train to the neutralization train or either of them to the optimization train. Have three trains, manage them separately. Okay, and you're managing one for speed, one for distance, and one for fuel. Okay, that, that's the game you're playing. Now, just to close on this thing, in addition to the three good things that can happen when you spend money on innovation, two bad things can happen. One is you failed. Okay, and some amount of failure has kind of got to be built into the system. But the one that drives you crazy is when you waste. And, and, and basically, wasting is just doing the opposite of all the things we've been advocating. So how do you waste? You, you do a differentiation project, but you don't really get outside the yellow circle, or you get just outside. You wasted that entire budget. Because as soon as the yellow circle catches you up, all that power you were going to have, you don't have that power. So you spent your power budget, but you didn't get power. Neutralization, you didn't do fast. You went too far. It was not, you went beyond good enough, and you also too, too, took too much time. You just. The competitor was like just dancing in the aisles, thinking, wow, we got another free quarter from those bozos. Amazing. Okay? And I mean, you got to believe, well, I won't, okay. Never mind. <laughs> I have to be careful. It's public. It's on the, you said it's public internet? Okay. I didn't, no. You're not, not, you're, you're not a bozo, sir. You're a client. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very different. Okay. <laughs> Or, or optimization, uh, optimization projects that don't really go after the sacred cows. So you optimize everything except sales and engineering. So you just beat the out of the you know out of the, out of the people that are in the cafeteria. But if you but if it's an engineer or a salesperson, oh wow, I can't touch those two. Well, that's 85 percent of your headcount is it's 100 percent of the things that are making the difference. So it's like crazy not to optimize the important things. Now this is my favorite slide to show clients once they kind of have done the mea culpa and they're sort of doing the flagellation and they're kind of, oh God, we're terrible. You know, you say, okay, here's the thing that you've got to realize and you as the product line manager have to realize. That wasted money, that's in your budget. That's your money, okay? It's already, you don't have to go ask people for more money. That, you own that money, right? If you stop wasting it, nobody's going to come to you and complain. You're not going to get a letter saying, oh, you stopped wasting that money. What's the matter with you, right? Okay? And if you spend it on better things, there is an upside to what the heck you're waiting for, okay? And that's kind of the call to action as an offer manager, which is there is no excuse for you not to act now. Because you, you don't have to go get more money. You have the money already. You're just wasting it. Okay? So yes, you have to go through the extraction thing. And, and, and yes, you've got to make sure it's repurposed. And by the way, if you just extract the money, if you just optimize and don't innovate, I mean, don't differentiate or neutralize, you won't get to keep the money. The CFO will take that money and say, thank you very much. Give me some more next quarter. Okay? So you've got to take that money and immediately put it into Neutralize or differentiate. Okay. So, so the, the, this, is the, the, this, this is the kind of stuff where we've got frameworks around you know, the, the, the neutralization, the differentiation, productivity frameworks, the waste framework, and the net differentiation idea. This is this, that's a chapter in the book. It's a chapter written for people who, who have offer power in their purview, their product line manager kind of person. And it's intended to create a vocabulary and a set of models to have a better conversation and think about your management opportunities from a power point of view, not just a performance point of view. And so that's, that's one chapter in this thing. And, and as I said, there's, there's five core chapters in the middle of this thing. And with that, I think I'll once again sort of throw it back open to questions. So, oh. No, <laughs> we're over, over time. We're a little over time, so can you stick around and just? I will stay. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Good. Right. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.